Joanna and Stephen, what an absolute pleasure to have you on Happy Place. How are you? We're just now in a happy place. Couldn't be better. It's been pretty nice. So glad. To be with you, Fern. This is it. <laughs> oh, well, I'm so glad. And congratulations on your new podcast, Joanna and the Maestro. And I know, obviously, I've had a sneaky listen to episode one where, Stephen, you explain what a maestro is. But for anyone who doesn't know, could you just elaborate a little on that for us? <laughs> a conductor with the, <laughs> the title of maestro is, <clears throat> is accorded out of respect in this country. In Italy, everybody is called a maestro who's, who's in charge of an orchestra. Um, I, I, I suppose it, it, the easiest way of describing it is uh, when you work with an orchestra and you prepare a programme, um, you, you are king for the day, i.e. everybody is signed up to the process of playing... Beethoven 3 or Sibelius or whatever the music is um, and that's the order of the day. They literally say to you, how would you like us to do this? And so you then of course um, uh, set to work and, um, and mould it the way you think it should be done. And me, Fern, as an absolute duffer, married to the maestro, I'm allowed to ask all the questions that uh, people like me, middle of the road listeners who just adore music, but don't know a great deal about how it works, how a symphony is created or how the orchestra is set out or why Beethoven and Mozart are very similar but very different and all kinds of things like this. But it, it's, it's so, um, I would like to say this favourite word, accessible, that anybody in the world who's just got the faintest interest in music could listen, I hope, to these podcasts and be illuminated largely by the maestro. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, I loved episode one for that very reason. And although you focus on classical music, you, you do venture off into other areas. I, I loved on episode one, Stephen, you talking about your love of Led Zeppelin, which I very much share. They are my favourite band out there. I'm thrilled you're in good company. Yeah. Could you pick a favourite Led Zeppelin song? Is that even possible? Oh, for sake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the classics, but... Um... You Shook Me Baby is uh, one of the greats, I think, and A Whole Lot of Love is the famous one with the, uh, well, you know, um, I, 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 honestly, I honestly do travel with the CDs of Led Zeppelin when I, when I go away on tour. Wouldn't, couldn't do without them. It's so exciting. The important thing is that music is music. That we shouldn't be dividing everything into categories because it, it because it makes people think well I like this category but I don't like that category and, and it, it's all music. I love the fact, Fern, that quite often people get to know very favourite pieces of classical music because they're played in commercials. Yeah, uh, you know, air on a g-string, for instance, for that cigarillo, which I or whatever it was, a cigar, long ago. But then almost all kinds of things from Hovis bread and and things like this. E even now, there are, there are um, commercials and people get to know things. Even in football chants, Ness and Dorma and things like this, people feel it's their own music. It, of course, comes from great classical pieces and often from opera as well. So kind of magic. We've just got to stop dividing it up and saying, I'd, oh, oh, I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't know how that goes. So with any luck, these podcasts are to let people in, let the that let the daylight in on what seems to be a kind of eclectic, esoteric, I don't know what either of those words mean, but those, <laughs> those are E-words, the E-words, and, uh, and let people in and go, oh, I kind of love this, I understand this, it's interesting, you know. Yeah, and there have been so many studies recently showing how classical music specifically is so good for our mental well-being, for focus, if you're studying, it's a wonderful thing to have in the background just to kind of help you get into a really calm headspace have, have you experienced that do you use classical music for focus or just general relaxing i've just got to jump in here because stephen if he's listening to music that's it that's music he doesn't do anything else at all so all the people who study or to write things or maybe if you're maybe if you're doing something ironing is easy because you don't use your brain at all but people who actually are doing things with music in the background stephen goes into quite a huff because he's, oh. music should have full attention paid to it um, and, and I, like many other people on the planet, put stuff on and go, this is gorgeous and this is playing in the background, this is lovely. Sometimes it's so compelling that you stop doing what you're doing. But music can be everywhere, um, but it mustn't become wallpaper, which is behind you and actually Fern looking ravishing. 
This is my my fabric wall. It's like a squidgy soundproof fabric wall, isn't it? Gorgeous. Stunning, and it's stunning. But music yeah. it should never really be um, wallpaper because it's always got to be listened to. But you've got two sides of your brain: one which is the working side, and the other which is parallel, same side, listening to the gorgeous music. Mm. So you're totally divided on this. Yeah, I, I I can get that because I'm imagining, like for instance, Stephen, if I'm listening to another podcast or I'm watching somebody interview someone, I have very little enjoyment doing so because I'm just deconstructing how they've worked out the interview, the the navigation of the conversation. Do you are you can you get into the headspace of just listening to music for enjoyment, or are you constantly deconstructing and listening to the technical side of things? No, I. I all music affects affects me i think everybody too um in, in an intellectual way i.e the way that it's happening um and what it um how it's constructed and the other is the emotional um side of it now i'm not talking about the biggest of emotions all the time although in puccini operas you 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 weep you actually weep in in, in the experience of um la bohème um so you but i absolutely agree with you that is the way i see but uh, i hear music as well i'm i i can see it on the page i'm i'm uh constantly turning over um how the conductor has done it um because every conductor differs every performance is different um so i i get very concentrated i'm taken over by music and look i have to say that's the same with led zeppelin it's the same with abba it's it, it's exactly the same for me so music as as, as a background i i can't, I can't no. really cope with it <laughs> i bet your brain you just goes into I can't do both things at once i you you know it's uh, tv nowadays has too much music behind programs like country file <laughs> Um, I find myself there. Oh God, oh, God! There's going to be more music. and up it starts again, and then it dies <laughs> after five seconds, and someone starts talking, and then and then a shift of scene, and they put on another piece of music. I'm, you know, I'm an emotional wreck after something. <laughs> I live with Captain Rage, Captain. Ang- <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. And in episode one, Joanna, you talk about. Um, your own musical interest and that you used to play the piano a bit and is that is do you keep it up is that something that you still enjoy sort of having a quick tinkle of the ivories I think when I was first introduced to a piano which was when I was eight because when we were when we were young we were in the far east and we were traveling with we, I was an army brat as it were my father was traveling with his Gurkha regiment all over the place born in India then out to Hong Kong then to Malaya and we, Malaysia as it is now and we didn't have a piano but when we came back to this country um, and I put my hands on the piano for the first time, I realized that I could pick out music I could hear in my head and I could pick it out on the piano keys. And so I've never learned to read music. I mean, I've learned a bit about it, but I can't put a piece of music up and play it. But I could pick it out in my head on the on the keyboard. Now, when I married Stephen much later on in life and I saw what he could do on the keyboard, I quietly folded my hands in my lap. <laughs> and so now, if ever I strike up a couple of chords, it's when Stephen is nowhere near. <laughs> I understand that. I, I get that completely. I'm married to a musician myself. And I mean, I don't have any musical skill whatsoever, but I would certainly not even attempt it with my husband in the same room. There's absolutely no way. And you've been married now for, is it 37 years? Oh, very good. That, well, it's that's what we think it is. It is. You think? This year. It's 37 this year. But you've actually known each other and of each other for a lot longer than that. You were in sort of similar friendship circles. Is that correct? When you were a lot younger. It is, um, it's really odd because I'm eight years old. Yeah. And I first heard his name. This is odd. I heard the name Stephen Barlow of a young and clever musician aged 13 who was at school with the son of some close friends of mine. And he was going to come out to lunch when I was with the friends because they were at a boarding school and he didn't turn up for lunch. And I remember feeling then, I remember I was 21, 22, disappointed, this is odd, disappointed that a boy I'd never heard of, I mean, I'd never met, didn't come out to lunch. So well, that was, was already a shadow in the future. I was incredibly <laughs> disappointed too, because I'd also I bet you were. this rather, rather lovely, beautiful model who'd be there on Sunday for lunch and I'd turn up for lunch and she was never there. Oh, 
my God. I mean, absolute fate, though. And is it correct that a little later down the line, Stephen, you popped a note into Joanna's door saying you were in the area and could you go for tea? And that ignited this gorgeous romance and marriage. Yes, and we'd first met at a, at the at the um, wedding of the said school friend of Stephen when Stephen was playing the organ. This was down in Dawlish in Devon. And, mm. uh, and I met Stephen the first time down there when he was... Um, f- furious playing at the organ because the sheet music hadn't arrived and he was supposed to be playing Queen of Sheba or what was it you were supposed to be playing? No, it was Queen of Sheba. Queen yeah, of Sheba. Right. And the music wasn't there and he was pretty cross. And I saw this sort of white-faced, black-haired musician sitting there being furious and my heart went bang. But we were I was with somebody else and also Stephen was sort of only very young and having just left university but was already conducting all over the country and playing all over the country. And uh, I was modelling. We were in separate worlds, so we didn't meet up really until eight years after that. So it's a fairly spaced out. I mean, we'll soon find out that um, when I was a toddler, that uh, that I, <laughs> then I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I love spaced. that though. It does show you that even if you know you're in a relationship or whatever obstacles you're in your way, if the person you're meant to be with is out there, you will end up with them. I think. I think you. I think you will. I think fate which organises things in a way that we don't always know. So yeah. always keep your spirits up. Don't ever feel downcast at whatever situation you're in because the chances are it's going to change. Yeah, and also we get quite controlling, don't we? We try and micromanage moments because we think we're in control. But actually, as your story evolved, you can see quite clearly that it, it's fate. It's kind of out of our hands a lot of the time. I think it is. Um, and I think that time is not linear. I don't think it starts here and goes, 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 goes. I think it's more like a huge shadow around an oak tree. And you can sometimes recognise bits of it which haven't happened yet, which is mm. what I think it was when I heard Stephen's name when he was 13. Something went ding in my head and some bit of my brain said, this person's going to be molto importante Italian, <sighs> um, for much later on in life. <laughs> I love it. I I love gorgeous romantic stories so I'm very happy to hear it it's a beautiful one and this is your first time working in this capacity together so how's that been it's been fascinating because we've done we've done music pieces together um what did we do first of all we did well you narrated Peter and the Wolf yeah Prokofiev's wonderful thing um we you then narrated Vaughan Williams's Oxford Oxford Elegy. Elegy Um, and then and Stephen wrote the most beautiful um, opera on one no, of Michael Walker's. It's, well, it's, it's, it? it, it's a piece with narrator. It's piece. a story with a with a narrator. narrator. Michael Morpurgo's lovely book, The Rainbow Bear, which is just a heavenly piece. It's a little bit sort of almost like climate changey piece, but it isn't really. But it's a ravishing piece, and it's got narration in it. And so we did that together, and that was. But that was just heavenly. But I've got to say, I wouldn't choose to work with Stephen too often because the world, the world of music is so different from the world of acting. Actors is full of p- people pitching up for read-throughs going, oh my God, the bus was late today. Who was there? No, I'd love a coffee, please. No, I think I have a lot. No, actually, I'm going to have a cup of tea. So all this yip-yap goes on all the time. In music, in, when you arrive and there's an orchestra already and the maestro is on the podium and you come and he says, this is my wife who will be narrating. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the orchestral musicians go to tap, tap, tap with their bows or occasionally shuffle their feet or do something to show Which is them. to say you're very welcome. Which is to say you're very welcome, but yeah. non parlando, don't speak anything. <laughs> and then suddenly he picks up the baton and off we go and you go, blimey, where's all the, how are you and where's my pencil? None of it's that. It's straight in, straight. There's no time to waste. You've got to get on with it. Right, man. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And, and how does that feel, Stephen, if you've got a gorgeous orchestra sat before you and you're you're leading this piece of music you know i've watched many a beautiful performance um orchestra performing and to watch a conductor you know i have no understanding of what it all means and how it works but i'm imagining that feels sensational it does there's nothing there's nothing more rewarding when you get things right but but the 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 principle is that Everybody there with the music, everybody in the orchestra can play the piece. They can play it perfectly. They, they, they've all got the music in front of them. So that you, you don't need to be, you know, in that stereotypical idea of a conductor bringing people in when they're supposed to play. They know it all terribly well. And so it's a, it's a subtle business of rather like a guiding um, a horse who knows exactly where to go. And um, if you treat it with care, it will go the way you want it 
the, the way you want it to. Um, and every musician will say, um, okay, what would you like to do with this? And it's a privilege and an honor. You, you are a guest um, and they let you um, have free reign for that day. And then someone else will come in the next day and you move on to another opera or another, another concert. It's interesting actually, Fern, because um, I've listened to classical music all my life and quite a lot of it's been on what we used to call gramophone records, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, recorded music. And you hear different, you hear pieces of music that you're familiar with played at different speeds or with different emphasis on different parts of it. And it's always interesting because you tend to use as the benchmark, the judgment, the first time you heard it and fell in love with it. Then if somebody plays it faster or slower, I sometimes say to Stevie, is this too fast? Is this too fast? And he goes, no, I think this is lovely. And I go, but it's faster than the time I heard so-and-so conducting it, you know? So it's, it's, it's a matter of, it's a matter of taste and a matter of timing and the times when people played things very, very fast and furiously, or times when people have stretched it much more, m taken things much more slowly. And you go, is this too slow? And Stevie says, no, listen, this works really well at this tempo. <laughs> so it's, I mean, you hear things differently all the time. Well, of course. And, and how much um, of this sort of conversation outside of your podcast would you be having naturally? Is it beneficial, do you think, to your marriage that you both orbit in very different worlds work-wise. Do you come back from a day conducting or a day on a TV set and discuss it and talk about your days? Or do those worlds sort of exist on their own and you come back and you just talk about everyday stuff? No, no, we, we do. We, you, I, I love theatre. I'm completely enthralled to actors who I think are, um, I, well, I do just, I just don't know how they even begin to characterize um, a character in a play. I do not know how they do it. And I asked Simon Williams this, um, you know, why, 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 why do I have this problem of not understanding how, I mean, I can't act. And he said, oh, you just have to be natural. And I thought, that's just the pig of an answer. <laughs> because even actors do not know exactly how they do it. So I'm in love with the theater. And we will, we will, of course we do. If I come back from a hard day and it's been hard work, but good work, um, I think, I think Jo can, can tell and she'll ask. And, and I, I, did, um, I did a play, Blythe Spirit, at the Vaudeville Theatre in London. This is quite early on in our relationship. And Stephen was um, working, he never stops working, but he used to come and sit in my dressing room and the tannoy is on, Fern, and you know that you can hear the play in the dressing rooms as it's going by. And he'd sit in my dressing room as I'd rush on stage as Elvira, you know, the ghostly presence. And you, you came time after time. And I said, you didn't have to come. He said, I just love it. He loved hearing the play being done. Mm. Slightly different every night because mm. we're all human beings. So everything is slightly different. The audience makes things slightly different. This, I think, is one of the big differences is that the audience affects how we play it. Um, particularly for playing a comedy, you can tell whether they're very quick and are adoring it and they will roar with laughter. So you can sometimes squeeze or milk or extend a joke or a situation. And if they're hating it, you can hurry it along. But music, if you notice, the maestro, the conductor, has his back to the audience. It's almost as if the music is more important. Of course you feel it, but you don't mm. know how the audience is enjoying it. You just go on. Whereas as theatre players, we, we are receptive to how the audience is. It's always more of a two-way. How interesting. I'd never thought of it like that. That's because, I, you know, I've probably been more on the receiving end of how you felt it to be, Joanna, if I've ever had to present something on stage and you very quickly see if people are into it or not. But how right fast, with music, so there, with there's more respect almost with music. You respect what's going on. Exactly that. And Fern, we've been there when houses have been, audiences have been a bit cool. And yeah. you think, damper through this and just liven them up a bit. Or <sighs> just keep going. Come on, just keep on going. They're going to love this eventually. Or other times when you get up there and you can't speak because the roar is so great, you can hardly speak for the first two minutes. And so you can play that. Not so with music. And I, yeah. I think that actors, are, well, I've always felt that the senior service, in the armed services, the senior service is the Navy because it's, it's one of the oldest and it was one of the most faithful to the crown, incidentally, which is why, and I'm doing this on television for us, but people at home, which is why sailors salute the hand flat 
and army and air force have to f- salute like this to show they've got no weapons <laughs> oh Did- yes i didn't know that no. do you see what i mean so anyway the senior service is music as far as i'm concerned so yeah I started with everything to do with music and i want to pick up every hint and every clue which is why i've dragged questions which i think ordinary people like us you're nothing nothing about you as ordinary fan but anyway, no you're very wrong there joanna we're, I'm um, just saying we're ordinary people which just for the moment we are ordinary yeah. people might like to ask somebody who's a specialist no That's- absolutely i mean I, you know i am obsessed with music but i cannot play an instrument but i i'm obsessional about it so i completely understand this desire this need to unpick it to understand how it works can either of you remember the first time that music made a huge impact on you in your life, maybe in your childhood, a moment where you were just sort of swept away with what you were listening to? Or maybe, Stephen, it was something you were playing yourself. Well, my parents both loved music. They had a, a, a typical a typical record collection of couples in, in, in those days. They were both in their early 20s when when I was born and so they had a mix a mix of music and but the thing is that neither of them had ever had music lessons but they both loved it um so I started off with the piano when I was five which is the ideal age to begin and I suppose the difference between me and my brother who's four years younger and is a very good musician himself the, the difference would be that I was hooked. So, can you remember the piece that hooked you? No, 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 because it's not. It's not like that. I, first of all, I was gripped by the sound the piano made, and the the more you played it, the better you got at playing it, and you found chords and harmony, um, and the magic of the different the different um, uh, you know very high in the keyboard sounds from very low and certain intervals and so so i was hooked and from that moment on i i was always wanting to be in whatever the music was which included all sorts of stuff i mean the very first time i heard proper dixieland i must have been about nine or ten and then of course um somebody found me the sheet music hidden on the keys um, and I've remained entranced with that and then jazz um, in the same way. So there's you know, not a particular piece of music. In a way, you know, I'm still hearing a piece of music that I th- thought I might know, but I'm realising that I didn't and it knocks knocks my hair off. In mm. a rather more mundane way, because we travelled, because I was an army brat and travelled with my my soldier father who was, who was with the Gurkhas and, and my mother and my older sister, we were traveling around from India to Hong Kong to Malaysia. And we had a wind up gramophone and big old black 78 records. And uh, you had to put on to hear a whole Beethoven symphony, you had to have about four or six records and turn them over when you got to the end of the piece of, you know, to the end of the movement or whatever it might be. And I think one of the first things that really struck me was Dvorak's New World Symphony, because, because it was so ethereal and so extraordinary and because I see pictures every time I hear music I see visions rather like um rather like in Fantasia Disney's huge and people say flawed and people say unsuccessful but I think understandably magical piece of music where he Mm. saw when when cellos started playing he saw zig 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 lines Mm. coming across and all kinds of different flourishing and then of course he turned it into cartoon creatures but there's there's something in my head that just sees pictures and images and as I was always visual as a child I just couldn't hear enough of these different landscapes and different situations and different stories that were told. I just adored it. Mm. Is there a piece of music or it might sit outside of the classical world that can really draw up emotion, bring tears to the eyes or takes you back to a very specific moment that is sort of overwhelming emotionally? Um. Oh God, it's it's really so difficult because if I watch, for instance, if I watch the opera, The Marriage of Figaro, watch and hear The Marriage of Figaro, when we come to the Countess's aria, which is Dove sono i bei momenti, where have all the good times gone, really, she's saying, about her marriage, which seems to be falling apart. When I hear the music beginning to build up to that, 
literally like floodgates, I start sobbing because it is the, the, the whole piece of it is so unbearably beautiful. At the very end of Valkyrie, when is it? Who is oh. it? When when she's being put to sleep, as it were, yes. his daughter. He's Votan's putting his daughter. Wotan's farewell to Brunhilde. Is it Brunhilde? To his daughter. And he sets a ring of fire around her. Well, you can't you can't even watch it for pouring with tears. It's just moving beyond belief. But earlier on, those weren't the things that that moved me and touched me. That could have been just almost anything. Eine kleine Nachtmusik, just for the sheer, clear, lucid, like a spring water, as though you'd almost composed it yourself. Just perfect, perfect music, magic. Mm, so gorgeous. It is just the most powerful thing, isn't it? I think for me, out of all of the um, sort of stimulants to the senses, music is the one. It's the one that gets you the quickest. I think absolutely. Would you say, well, Stephen, obviously, I once asked Stephen what he would do if there was no music. He said he'd be dead because <laughs> because because music is his breath. Literally. Yeah, or, I get it. And because he's always got music in his head, he doesn't have to. Oh, I can tell you a secret about conductors, about mm. maestro. My God. Which is oh, God, tell us. Go on. Well, this is it. When they're studying, and it might be a new opera, or it might be an opera they're going back to, and they've got the full score with a thousand instruments written down and all the things, and you just hear, this is what I hear, the swish of a page turning. We don't have the house. People say, oh, the house must be full of music. No, he's not listening to that. He's not listening. He's listening in his head. <laughs> so when he turns the pages, he's hearing the whole thing in his head. Wow. His home life in the Barlow household is very silent. <gasps> How glorious. Well, That's no, the opposite, opposite <laughs> of my house. <laughs> My house is like a zoo. I would love that the swish of a page to be the only noise that I have to endure past 4 p.m. on a school day. God help me. It's an absolute nightmare. Um, Joanna, obviously, in the 60s and 70s, you were on film sets, TV sets, and whenever I pour over gorgeous books about that era, I'm obsessed with the music and the fashion of that era. It all felt, it was this huge revolution. Fashion and music were intertwined. It just felt like this incredible time of exploration and expressiveness. When you think back to that era, what sort of music springs to mind? Oh, well, I just adored, I mean, it was the time of, I think, the greatest music kind of ever spilling out of this country, which was the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and all, all, all of those things, but also coming across from America were the Everly Brothers, Elvis, there was early Cliff at school, I used to pretend to be Cliff at school, <laughs> so for crying, dog. I used to get my tennis racket <laughs> at my boarding school and pretend to be Cliff. And when I met him later on, I had to confess to this, and he was so charming about it. He was very... Oh, but he was so chuffed. No, he was... He, well, he, not chuffed, he wasn't actually chuffed. But he of course was he was. He was. Of me, kind of swat... <laughs> I was by this time only knee high because I was lying on the floor to show how appreciative I was. Of <laughs> but I mean, I just... All the music, but all the fashion then. And I've got to emphasise something, which is that we were all much poorer. So if there was a nightclub or a restaurant that was great and quite... The, in those days, in the 60s I'm talking about, Italian food was very new to England. Mm. In places like um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, I'm getting Alvaro's, you know, chic Italian restaurants. If you went in there, you'd see Rudolf Nureyev and Mick Jagger and Princess Margaret because everybody went out then because there was no, because there was no social media, you, was, you were pretty safe. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There. People, I can remember seeing Paul McCartney catching a taxi in Regent Street. You can't see this nowadays. Money meant very little in those days. We knew people, rock stars made money, but even the rock stars didn't even get the money. Sometimes they'd give them 50 quid a week or something. I remember asking Rod Stewart what was the happiest time in his life. And he said, I liked it when we were all in a van and used to travel around together. And he used to hang all his clothes up round his little tiny room, this stage performance clothes. And so we were all much, it was all much more normal and much shabbier at the edges. As models, we would bring our own things. We had to bring our own, bring and do our own makeup and hair and everything. But we had to bring our own accessories. We had to bring our bags, our jewellery, our tights, our shoes, boots, models own. You know, it was quite often written. In the <laughs> so we had no, none of, we did it all <laughs> ourselves. And it was at a much scruffier level and therefore much more exciting, I think. I think so. I mean, I was listening to your uh, conversation with Twiggy, which I just loved every second of that. You both reminiscing about these 
extraordinary times. And I love the fact that you call her twigs. Like the whole thing was just so enjoyable. But it did just feel like the most exciting time for music and fashion, the whole thing. It was just, I wish I'd been there. I know, because I think this is it. And it's horrible because we all need money, want money when the world's going through such a tough time. And I don't mean to sound dismissive about it, but the truth is, is that money was not the object. It was doing something good. It was being a great creative painter, an artist, being a fine actor, being a brilliant hairdresser. Hairdressers were huge in those days. Mm. Charles Sassoon was absolutely, you know, the same as Pete Townsend of The Who. These were huge, huge characters. And you'd go, oh, look, that's Vidal, you know. Um, it, it, you just wanted to be the best you possibly could. And of course, you'd hang out with the same kind of people and in photo shoots. I can remember doing a, photo, a photographic session with Terence Donovan, one of the greats, one of the, um, the great three, Bailey, Duffy and Donovan. And uh, in slunk to stand at the back of the session was Terence Stamp, the most godlike of gods, the most beautiful young actor you can imagine. A movie star just like hanging out in the background, just having a look at what's going on. And, you know, I mean, I can't tell you. And the, mind you, the photographer would hardly even know your own name. So we as models were very sort of humble people. We weren't the ones who wouldn't get out of bed for ten, under $10,000 a day. We were on £4.50 an hour or something. Mm. So it was good fun, but it wasn't by a yacht. Do you know what I mean? No, but it was like you say the excitement of it and I wonder listening to you speak there for, for both of you do you think it's harder to be an artist today because I remember that really gorgeous interview with David Bowie many many years ago this was the sort of turn of the um of the internet sort of starting out and and people understanding what that digital world might mean but none of us really knew at that point but he seemed to have this incredible foresight that this was going to change everything and he seemed at the time, very pessimistic about it because his assumption was, OK, we've got this uh, device where we can communicate with people now. That's going to change how we imbibe art because his fear at the time, which has absolutely transpired, was that art would only be art once someone had commented on it or said this is art. Whereas I feel like back in the era that you're discussing, art was just art. Regardless of whether somebody commented on it, observed it, liked it on social media, exactly. it was just art. And if you knew that there was a gig playing on Eel Pie Island, you got yourself down there because somebody had said, this might be great, it might be good. It, it wasn't fed to you. you. There was no kind of approval. There were no ticks on anything. You just raced to where you thought it would be. You would go to the shop where you thought they had the, the best kind of, you know, whether it was Mary Quant or whatever, or Bieber, you know, the Bieber shop. Originally, the little Bieber shop was like a tiny corner sweet shop. And there were f the fight, the queue to get in to buy boots for three pounds. And even in those days, three pounds wasn't a lot of money, but you mm -hmm. could get a dress and a feather boa and a pair of boots and you would be as hot as smoke. And it hadn't cost you very much money. And it wasn't great designer. It wasn't Gucci and Chanel costing masses and you having to have the name written on it. That was another thing. We never had names written on anything. That was considered very sort of base, very low. And so nowadays when people, when you have to wear a t-shirt with, it has to say on it what it was, otherwise nobody knows how much it cost. So the, the money side of it never came into it. It was mm. a clear time, I think, fun. Also in those days, I had a mini and I used to park it in the pavement and put a oh. message in it. I used to put a message in the window and say, visiting sick grandmother and hope <laughs> they didn't come and tow it away. <laughs> That's so good. Oh my God, take me back. I want to go back so bad. <laughs> my auntie was so obsessed with Bieber that I now have a cousin called Bieber. How gorgeous. It's, it's a great a, name. It's a great name anyway, yeah. It's a great where, name. Where did your name come from, Fern? Do you know what? I don't really know. I think because my name's spelt really strangely too, and I I think my mum just sort of stuck some extra letters in there for I don't know what reason, but you now we've got some interesting names in our family. Um, some interesting names, just for a second. We've got time. Tell me your interesting names in your family. Okay, so we've got Bieber. We've got uh, Bieber sisters called Shannon, which is probably a slightly more um, so common name enough. today. Enough. But it, but it wasn't. Yeah, it it wasn't. It wasn't when she was born. So Shannon, Bieber. Bieber's got some unusual names on her side. Her cousins. Um, who else have we got on my side? We've got um, a Blake. We've got an Elisa. We've got some, we've got some nice names. My <laughs> mum wanted to give my brother an unusual name and then my dad called him James and just sort of did it without mum. Well, yeah. she 
there was permission there, but it was very much he, he went with James. James is lovely. My son's called James. Yeah, so you call him Jamie, and that's my my brother's also a Jamie now too. Lovely name. Yes, I think something interesting, and then we'll just drop it at once. Go on. There didn't seem to be anybody before who was called Elvis. Where did that name come from? I I know. I it's love that. that. I mean, since then, we've had Elvis Costello and so on, but before then, nobody was called Elvis. And before Rudyard Kipling, the great writer, nobody was called Rudyard. And I guess also Elton. I know that's not his real name, but Elton. I don't know any other Eltons or Madonnas, quite frankly. Well, Madonna <laughs> is a kind of a fairly familiar word. word. It is. I guess it is. Yeah. I just don't know anyone called Madonna. No. <laughs> it's a bold statement, isn't it? It is quite odd, isn't it? It's Madonna really bold. She knows you, Fern, but obviously she doesn't. She, no, she God, Madonna, she Madonna doesn't care about me. Don't be mad. I, said, I wish I was on Fern's show. She kept oh, on. No, I've interviewed her only once and I've never been so terrified in my entire life. It was... She's smart as a whip, isn't she? Yeah, she's just terrifying. Brilliantly ter terrifying. Um, when you're having low mood, either of you, or you feel a bit blue, would you then navigate, uh, sort of move towards listening to music that uplifts you, or would you like to wallow in it and listen to music that makes you cry and makes you feel sadder? Well, I can jump in at first with this. The first thing I'd do, if I was really sad, I'd put on Jackie Wilson singing Reet Petite, which, which you literally cannot sit still to, and you cannot stop grinning to. But when I was down, 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 in the old, old, old days, if I ever got a gloom, I would put on Beethoven's Eroica and I'd play it very loud and it cleared, it literally cleared gloom out of the place. Wow, I need it's to try a, this. Eroica, one of the gracious things in the world. And you you suddenly think, oh the, oh, the world's okay. It sets things back to normal. You know when things are jangled and out of stuff and you don't know how to make them, you don't seem to be able to make it work. Beethoven finishes the jigsaw puzzle. Magic. Mm. How about you, Stephen? Oh, I want the lot all the time. <laughs> I, I want uh, you, I, I want um, very sad blues. Um, I want I want Frank Sinatra, you know, over and over. I keep, you know, and, and the sad songs. I, I want all that. And I want Ella Fitzgerald um, at the same time as um, look, Mozart wrote 666 pieces. Now that's quite a lot. So you, there's Mozart for, you know, and Bach cantatas for goodness sake. He wrote he wrote 104 as far as I can remember. It might be 105, but it was it's certainly a lot. So I, I'm never at a loss. Um, but I, I I must say I don't I don't use music to get me out of a mood. I let music put me into a mood. Mm. of, of, of um, you know, appreciation of it and diving into it, getting lost in it. Where Stephen also gets lost is watch, watching snooker. I just thought I'd pop that in. Right. Snooker's your That's thing. It's just the click of a ball and you go, oh, no, we've got the snooker. That's my father-in-law is the same, obsessed with snooker. Yeah, I got something else. I, again, I don't understand snooker at all. How do, you, how do you feel about silence? Do you like silence? Do you opt to cultivate silence at any point? Does it does it help you in your work with your headspace? Well, yes, I love silence. I, we, we have a tiny cottage up in Scotland, which and I've been up there to compose sometimes um, on my own for a fortnight or whatever. And the silence is golden. Um, and the beautiful thing is that it's, it's not pure silence because that would drive us tonto. But the, the, the more you the more you listen to silence, i.e. you don't have any distracting sound, um, you begin to be much more alert and aware um, and but without distractions. Do, do you know what I mean? I, I yeah, love I love silence, too. I love silence because I've got so many thoughts in my head that if I'm distracted by noise, particularly by people talking, um, you, 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 you could, A, you can understand what they're saying. I think this is one of the reasons, Fern, that people love going abroad, is that you can't take in what's going on. Sometimes you can't even read the language. If you're in India, you probably can't even read the language. And quite often, if you're, let's say, in Hungary, you can't understand the language. So you're freed from any kind of link 
to what's going on. You don't know what the news is. You don't know what they're advertising. You don't know what they're discussing. So it can just wash over you and you're left alone again. I think we've got to be quiet more often. And quite yeah. often television programs, when they think we'd better put in a bit of music, I'd love to hear the sound of somebody's feet scrunching over the gravel or the sound of a bird or the sound of the handle of the big door opening. I don't need music behind it. I like to hear actual sound. Actual sound is magic as well. But mm. silence is golden. Cue the tremolos. I mean, cue the trems, <laughs> literally. Yeah, I, I think it's probably the thing we're lacking the most in the modern world. We're addicted to distraction and to constant noise. So we don't have to think, maybe. We don't have to dive into what's going on in our heads. And I think, you know, there's a beautiful book uh, called Silence by this amazing um, Norwegian explorer called Erling Kaga. And it's just his journey of, you know, he might be walking the three poles and he's just in silence and what he's learned from that. And I do think it's probably the thing we're all desperately lacking the most. I was cast away on a desert island a long time. Of course you were, yes. It was called um, Girl Friday. But yeah, I, before I went, I panicked. I thought, what is this going to be like? I've got no music. I've got no books to read. And as these sustain me, these are the things that sustain me. I can do without almost anything except books and music. And I thought, I'm not going to get those. What will it be like? The answer is, is that it's all in your head and silence allows it to bubble up. You remember tunes, you remember songs, you begin to remember the words of songs, you remember poems, you remember books, your mind springs up. So the more we put in through social media, God bless it, and our phones and being hooked on things, is that you're just forcing, forcing things in. And no wonder people reach breaking point because they're so packed up with stuff. What you've got to have is the silence to let your own thoughts come up because we're all we're all creatures, we're all creations, and we've all got our own thoughts and ideas. Whether we think we've got no ideas, we have got them, but you've got to let them come up to the surface. If you're putting stuff on top of them all the time, they get stuffed in and you eventually have what turns out to be a kind of mental heart attack, if you know what I mean. You get yeah. pissed and wrought up. Yeah, I, th I think many of us sort of reach that point of mental burnout because we are just taking on so much the bombardment of information that we're taking on a lot of the time unknowingly and unwillingly because it's just everywhere. But I, I totally agree. I think it is just a suppression of what's there. And, and, and maybe often we're actually a bit scared of what's in our heads, you know, as, as well as having ideas, maybe feeling inspired, remembering things There there might be stuff, I guess, that we're just not willing to look at. And so we're actively seeking that distraction, I guess, as well. I think, and also the terror of staring at a kind of blank canvas, and you're afraid that if you if you stop listening or watching or being in touch with your friends or something and hearing the conversation, that you might just not have anything, which is why it's always so good to, to, to walk or to do something, peel carrots or do something because, but in silence, because you'll find that being otherwise in, involved frees you. Staring at somebody eyeball to eyeball is not the best way to have a conversation, but quite often side by side, which is why good conversations take place either on walks or sitting in cars or standing at bus stops. You're not staring at each other, but you're side by side. And sometimes that's the best way of talking it out, getting stuff out. We've got to let stuff out and you can't do that if you're always putting stuff in. Yes, I absolutely agree. I think it's it's so massively important. Mm -hmm. And obviously uh, another of your huge passions, Joanna, is traveling. Um, and, and that seems to be something that, again, you perhaps couldn't live without alongside books and music. Would you say that's true? It's a sort of fundamental thing you need? I would. And because I was born, as it were, in a suitcase, traveling, traveling all the time, because army families are always traveling to and fro, and you have to leave school friends and make new school friends. You have to find a new bedroom. My mother had a little small carpet. She used to put it down, and there was a picture of a squirrel, and she'd hung the squirrel on the wall, put the carpet down. Wherever that was, was our bedroom and our home, for it might be for the next six months or the next three years, whatever it might be. And then on you go. So the feeling of traveling on seems quite alien to people but when you think right back to right back to when we were hunter gatherers everybody um we always moved on because you ate the food you could find and then you moved on and so babies are used to we rock babies like this or we push them and rock them it's because they used to be tied to their mother or their parent or father 
and the walking was the same as that. They were walking on. We were always walking. We were always moving on. And the reason people adore holidays is that you move on. You're going to somewhere else. You're going to put it. You're going to become a new person there. Mm. Life is different there. Better or worse, it's going to be new and it's going to be different, a new challenge. And so um, I love the idea of traveling. I love also, because I'm interested and extremely nosy, I like finding out how the rest of the world ticks and realizing at the end of it that although our governments, our administrations might differ hugely, which is why wars are going on at the moment, the people in those countries are exactly the same. So having traveled all the way across Russia from Siberia right across to Moscow, um, I fell in love with all the Russian people who couldn't have been more amusing, helpful, funny, charming, affectionate, joyous. And it seems to be completely at odds with the Russia we're presented with today as villains um, invading Ukraine. Of course, Russia has invaded Ukraine, but it's the Russian administration and therefore they've made their army do it. The people are hate, hating. If they knew, they'd hate it. They're not like that any more than we're like that. So all these things, we've got to look at who's running the country. I went to Iran and I couldn't have loved the Iranian people, the Persian people as they were more with respect. They're one of the most ancient and cultured races on earth. And suddenly to be depicted as villains, but we can see now a revolution is beginning to take place there where people are saying, do you know, we are women and we deserve to know things. It's going to be bloodthirsty, but underneath it, I look around here and I see all of us being women. Look at us uncovered, talking to each other, at e at equal with men. And to think that there are countries in the world where this is banned is bad. And so, you know, we've gone a little bit political here. Huh? We really political. have. And I didn't mean to do that because it's kind of music at the end of it. So okay, that was not part of the podcast. <laughs> okay, there we are. No, we love tangents are more than welcome around here. And do you like traveling together? Or is that something that you mm. would do? You do, yeah. I wish we could do more. I know. Uh, yeah. You know, but it's always been a problem with different schedules. And I bet um, musical diaries are planned years ahead. You know, um, whereas films and documentaries um, are quite often last minute green lit, as you know. So you're attached to something, and then it's green lit, and so all your dates change, and you have to do all that sort of thing. But the great thing is, is the last big trip I did, which was following the Spice Route, this called the Spice Trail Adventure. Um, which we finished in December. My very last destination, we've been through Indonesia, Southern India, Madagascar, Zanzibar. The very last part was in Jordan, where spices ended up before they were distributed to the Western world. And Stephen came out to Jordan for the first time in all of the 25 years I've been making doc documentaries. For the first time ever, Stephen was allowed to come because we travel such a small group. There are only six, six, seven of us. And we can't usually have extra people. So all of us who are married, who are making these things, have to leave our spouses at home. But this time, Stephen was allowed to come to Jordan and it filled my heart up. It was wonderful. It was good. Oh, but that's so lovely. Tagging along, though, with a working, with a with an incredibly hard working team. That's, that's what it was like. But my God, the things we saw, Petra, Amman, the Wadi Rum, the desert. Yeah. Just to just to get a flavour of it. Yeah. It's sensational. So incredible. And I, I recently reread your, your book, Joanna, No Room for Secrets, and, and you write about the sort of carrying around a little exercise book a lot of the time to write down notes, especially when you're travelling. Mm -hmm. Is sort of a daily journal something you do, or is writing just something that you therapeutically turn to when you, you feel the need? Sometimes I wrote um, journals, uh, and particularly... Uh, for instance, when I travelled across Bhutan with my cousin in the footsteps of my grandfather, who was a diplomat, long, long, long story, but that was a documentary. But I knew I was going to be writing a book at the end of it, which was going to be called Joanna I mean, The Kingdom of the Thunder Dragon, which is what Bhutan's called. And I knew that that was going to be a book so I could make proper notes because things you think you remember and even things you photograph are not the same as jotting down what it was like at the time. And uh, for instance, when I was in Madagascar, they have the most beautiful um, uh, right, as it were, a post-funeral right, which is that after five years, they exhume the body, which isn't really deeply dug, take the bones back to the village where they walk it around the village, the bones of the body around the village. And it's a very formal procession, which you're not allowed to film because it's taboo in that country. But they treat it, they drink quite a lot, they have musical instruments, there's a great, and there's a little kind of bundle of stuff on a kind of pyre going around. Now, unless you sit down, and actually write that down, 
you can't take a photograph if you, unless you write it down you'll think you'll think i forget this forever mm. and do you look back on them do you read them back to I see? Do. Yeah. I do. but only for myself only for myself and i think when i when I fall down dead, um, I think they can chuck them all on the on the bonfire. No, it's magic. Just for me, it's magic. No, yeah. they can't be burnt. We need the Joanna Lumley diary series to be published. I'll read all of them. My oh, goodness, treasure, darling. Treasure. Um, well, it's just so so lovely to talk to you both, and I loved episode one of your podcast. I can't wait to hear more of it and and learn more from it it's um it's just such a gorgeous listen and it's been a delight to talk to you both today so thank you so much well, thank, thank you, you so fern. much for talking thank to you. us fern can i just say something we actually yeah. we love you <laughs> we, yeah that's all just want to say it <laughs>